Wonderful, wonderful message that Daniel gave this morning. And I pray that the Lord sent you here this morning with a song in your heart. You hold on to that just for a moment. Uh, I want you to I want you to do what the Lord has for you to do this morning, but I've got to do this morning. Bless you, preacher. What I feel the Lord is calling us to do. We want to take you this morning into the book of Judges in the third chapter. We're going to go to verse number... 12. We're going to read from verse number 12 through verse number 27. So it's going to take us a moment. Although I said on Wednesday night it was going to take us a moment to read through. I made about six verses and we stopped and we just started preaching. So we have plans this morning on, on reading from 12 to 27. But we'll see how it goes. Uh, but dang it, my heart is heavy this morning and I, I appreciate your obedience and the message that you gave us just a moment ago. And, and the Lord uh, had given me a thought this morning, one direction that I feel like the Lord is going to continue to go in that direction, but he added to it and just put it all together as I was sitting there. And so when you saw me flipping through my Bible, I wasn't ignoring you. I just I just knew that there was something in there that I needed to grab a hold of so that we could tie all this together. And in verse number 12 of Judges chapter number 3, the Bible says, And the children of Israel did evil again, in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. You look right there in verse number 13. And, and I read all the way back in the book of Numbers, Jake, and Exodus. You know who the children of Israel were having issues with? Amalek. Here we go all the way down into the book of Judges, yep. and you know who they're still having issues with? Amalek. In the Bible, what we read, when we read about Amalek, Amalek represents the world or our flesh. It's just a battle that we continue to fight with, and every single time uh, that there's issues in our life, that seems to be what rises up against us. Uh, you don't fight the devil on the daily. You fight your flesh on the daily. That's right. The devil you fight against, sure, but it's not every day that you're going to rise up against him and he against you. But every single day, we've got to fight against that flesh Amen. and keep our flesh Amen. under subjection. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gerah, or Gerah a Benjamite, a man left-handed by him. The children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. But Ehud made him a dagger, which had two edges of a cubic's length, and he girded it under his raiment upon his right thigh. And he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end of the offering, the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. But he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee. O king who said, Keep silence from all that stood by him, went out from him. And Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in the summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat, and Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the haft, meaning the handle, the haft also went in after the blade. Thank you. And the fat closed upon the blade, so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly, and the dirt came out. Yeah. Then he had went forth through the porch, shut the doors of the parlor upon him, and locked them. And when he was gone out, his servants came, and when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked, they said, Surely he covered his feet in his summer chamber. And they tarried till they were ashamed. And behold, uh, he opened not the doors of the parlor. Therefore they took a key and opened them. And behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. And he had escaped while they tarried and passed beyond the quarries and escaped to Sarah. And it came to pass that when he was come, that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim, and 
the children of Israel went down with him from the mount, and he, before then, he can be seated this morning. Heavenly Fathers, we come to you this morning, Lord. We're thankful for you. We love you. We appreciate you. We stand in the place right now, Lord. We need your help. Help us this morning, Father, not to preach on emotion, but preach what thus saith the Lord. That everything said and done here this morning, Father, be according to thy will, Lord. Not because I want to share it, not because it's something that I feel like it needs done, Lord, but because you have sent a message this morning that we as a church need. God, that I need it as I studied, and the church needs now as I preach, Lord. I pray that you close the ears and open the hearts this morning, Father, of those that are in this congregation sitting here in the building, and those of our church that are listening in this morning, Father, that we would close off every distraction and listen to what thus saith the Lord this morning. Help me to preach with unction uh, and with power this morning, Father God, uh, that everything said and everything done uh, will give you glory, uh, honor, and praise this morning. Uh, for it is in your name that we pray, uh, and in your name we ask always. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to look through the book of Judges here for just a moment. And what we find here is for about 400 years, 350 years for the book of Judges, uh, the children of Israel uh, have gone down the same path over and over and over again. Uh, they come uh, and they serve God for a while. Uh, they do well. Uh, and then uh, they follow after these foreign kings. Uh, and they build uh, uh, these uh, idols and all these things. Uh, and they begin to worship the idols of Baal and, uh, and the prophets of the grove and all these things. Uh, and for 350 years, up and down, up and down, up and down. Uh, and it sounds an awful lot like uh, the society that we live in right now. Uh, when they bombed Paris, uh, it was pray for Paris. Uh, when 9-11 hit, uh, it was call out on God. Uh, but then just a few short years later, uh, we're serving sin. Uh, we're offering the idols. Uh, we're falling after the world. Uh, and have forgotten completely about God. Yeah. But I think this morning it's time we deal with the dirt. I think that this morning it's time that we as a Christian people, we begin to deal with the dirt, uh, the filth of this world, uh, the problems of this world, uh, the things that this world has to offer. Uh, but before we can deal with the dirt of this world, we've got to deal with dirt in our own life. That's good. I believe that there are Christians that sit among us this morning. Uh, you've got problems in your life. You've got dirt in your life. Uh, you've got filth in your life. Uh, and long before you can ever uh, do anything uh, to help the world or your neighbors, you've got to help yourself. Uh, you've got to take care of some problems for yourself. Uh, you've got to get where you need to be. Uh, before we can ever stand up uh, and preach against the filth out there, uh, we got to take care of the things that are going on in here. Uh, we got to take care of this person uh, right here that we look back uh, in the mirror every single day uh, and looks back at us. Uh, Brother Jeff preached a message some years ago uh, and he preached about the one thing uh, that would keep you out of heaven. Uh, the very one thing and he carried a box in uh, and in that box there was something that was real special. Uh, I mean it was real enlightening uh, and he handed that box and we passed around the church uh, and he said just look in that box uh, and what's in that box is the one thing that will keep you out of heaven. Of course everyone was astonished trying to figure out what it was. You know what's in the bottom of that box? A mirror. The only person uh, that can keep you out of heaven uh, is you. Uh, the only person that can allow sin in your life is you. Uh, the only person uh, that hinders your walk with the Lord is you. Uh, it's an individual thing. Uh, Curtis can't make me sin. Uh, Daniel can't make me sin. Uh, they can't put dirt in my life. Uh, but it's God, it's about me and the Lord. Yes, that's good. What we find here is for 18 years, 18 years they served Eglon. They were in bondage. They were there because of sin in their life. If you think for a moment that God won't do the same thing to the United States of America or this church or you individually, we read through the Bible and every time that Israel, His chosen people, every time they sinned against Him, they went into captivity. God called, amen, and brought judgment upon them. If Moses didn't get to go into the promised land, amen, if Aaron didn't get to go into the promised land, what makes you and I think for a moment that God won't bring judgment upon the individual in our lives. That's good preaching. But you think about this. 40 years they spent in the wilderness. Not every one of them sinned. But yet for 40 years they all went. Yep. We, 
as a society, oftentimes it's not the sin in my life, Kurt, or yours. It's not the sin in my life, Richard, or yours. It is the sin of society that brings things upon us. Now, I'm going to preach this right very specific this morning on where I believe this message came from. Because there's a vote that's about to take place in the Senate on the House bill for equality. But there ain't nothing equal about this equality bill, Daniel. There ain't nothing equal that's going on with this. They're talking about taking away uh, same-sex bathrooms, uh, taking away uh, same-sex locker rooms, uh, taking away a preacher's right uh, to preach against gay marriage uh, and transgender, uh, take away the parent's right uh, to raise your child in a Christian home uh, and tell them what they need to believe in uh, and raise them right. Uh, it's time we get rid of some dirt, uh, not just in the church or ourselves, but in society. It's time that we take a stand for what we know is right. Uh, hey, it's not time uh, to pull the blinders down over our eyes uh, and act like everything's going to be all right. Uh, we are under attack uh, as a Christian nation, uh, as the individual. Uh, we are under attack uh, by directly from the devil uh, in the society in which we live in. Uh, and it's our time to take a stand. They're coming directly after the Christian values. They're coming directly after Christian beliefs. Uh, they're coming directly after uh, Christian businesses. Uh, they're coming directly after churches uh, and pastors uh, and deacons uh, and good moral people uh, that want to stand up for right uh, and want to fight against the wiles of this earth uh, and the wiles of the devil. Uh, and they're coming directly at what we believe in. And they'll make it a criminal uh, offense for a man of God to stand behind the pulpit and preach the Word of God if it's contrary to what their law says. I'm going to tell you right now. They better call the sheriff. Amen? Amen. We're not, I won't back up. People down in jail, they need preached to just the same. Amen? Uh, I'm telling you this morning, uh, we as, a, we as a, a Christian nation, uh, we as a Christian people uh, have gotten lax on what we believe in. Uh, we've gotten lax on standing up for right uh, and gotten lax on standing up for truth. Uh, and we've been scared to death of something happening. Uh, we've been scared to death for standing up. Uh, we've been scared to death to get our name marred uh, and smeared. Uh, but you better believe and believe me well, uh, if you don't take a stand now, you're going to lose everything everything you ever stood for. Right. Senator Joe Manchin, Shelly Moore Capito, better realize this, it's our time that we make it known what we the people have for what to stand on. I, I saw somebody make, make an ignorant post the other day. It said, well, if churches want to begin to dip into politics, let them begin to pay taxes. Well, bless God, let me tell you something right now. This nation was found upon God and the principles of God. If they don't like it, or if you don't like it, find you another country to live in. We were based upon good moral values. Thank you, Tatum. It may be the only one I get. I know I'm preaching to the choir this morning. I realize that this morning. I know you stand up for right. I know you're against all the things that we're going. But it's not going to be good enough for us to just take a stand and say, we don't want that. We're going to have to pick up the phone and call down to the down to the senator's office and make a stand and say, look, you're supposed to be a representative of what we believe in and what we stand on. And Manchin's hid behind Planned Parenthood. And he's hid behind being a bipartisan. I'm just going to vote with what I believe in. He's hid behind all those things. It's time he takes a stand or gets out of office. I don't preach politics, but I won't stand for filth in this pulpit. You need to know what's coming up. You need to know what's going on. You need to know these things that are being trying to be slid by you. That's one of the things that's trying to be slid by you. It sounds good on the surface, but when you begin to dig in, it ain't nothing but filth. Bless you, preacher. It sounds good. Everybody should be treated the same way. Yeah, I believe that. The Declaration of Independence said that. Amen. Uh, for all men are created equal. Uh, well, equal means this. Bless God, we've all got the same rights. Uh, not one group gets rights over another. Uh, not one group forces themselves on another. Uh, not one group uh, gets to talk about or cut down on the other. Amen. The only people that are being uh, talked about or shoved to the side are the Christians. You better realize something this morning. If you don't take a stand now, and you don't fight right now, everything that your mother and father fought for, everything that you yourselves have fought for, we're going to lose. One vote. 
It's already passed the House by an overwhelming number. You better be ready. It's time that we deal with the dirt, Daniel. Bless you, preacher. That's good. The whole nation was in a mess because of a few that turned their back on what they believed in. And for 18 years, they spent in bondage. For 18 years, Eglon ruled and reigned over them until they finally had enough. You know what they did, Daniel? They did what they should have been doing all along. The Bible says they cried out unto the Lord. They cried out unto God. They made it known unto God what they wanted in their life. They realized they didn't want to live the same way that they were living. They didn't want to live in bondage. They didn't want to live in that filth. And God raised them up a deliverer in Ehud. God sent deliverance. Well, bless God, over 2,000 years ago in our life, God sent deliverance. He doesn't need to raise up another deliverer. We have the deliverer. We serve the deliverer. But it's going to take some Christian people that are willing to cry out, call out, and plead with God uh, and beg Him uh, to answer our prayers. Uh, it's not for you and I. I believe you and I can handle it. Uh, but these babies uh, that are going to grow up in this world, uh, these babies that are going to grow up in this field, uh, they're not going to be able to take the stand that you and I can take right now. They don't have the foundation, dang it, that we have. It's not okay in a science class for them to preach or teach pro-choice. You choose what you are. Bless God, the Bible says uh, God only made two genders uh, and you're born that way. Uh, you don't get to choose later in life. Uh, I don't really feel that way. Uh, well, bless your little heart. Uh, God already made the choice for you. Amen. You don't get a choice at that. It's filth. It's the same thing uh, that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for uh, and we're headed down the same path. Uh, if He didn't let them slide, uh, bless God, He ain't going to let us slide. Uh, we got to take a stand. Uh, and He told old, uh, Abraham, He said, uh, Abraham told him that if he could just find 50 uh, that are righteous, 40, 30, 20, 10, uh, finally God said, that's enough. Uh, no more. Uh, we're there. Uh, I believe it's pastors uh, in churches that are stood in the gap uh, to this point for this nation and pray God please help us defend us watch over us but the righteous number is dwindling and dwindling and dwindling before God's going to say that's enough that's enough if he didn't let them slide he's not going to let us slide we've got to take a stand we've got to deal with the dirt how did Ehud deal with the dirt the Bible said he made a dagger 18 inches long. The Bible says this in Hebrews 4 12. For the word of the Lord, sharp and powerful, quick, powerful, sharper than any two edged sword, dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Uh, amen. You know what Ehud made? Uh, he made the word, bless God. Uh, he, 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 he made something uh, that he knew was going to take care of the problem. Uh, he made something that he knew uh, would get to the root of the issue. Uh, amen. And God gave us that. Uh, amen. From the very beginning of time, for in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Uh, and the word became flesh and blood among us. Uh, amen. I'm telling you this. Uh, we've got exactly what we need to take care of the problems that we're facing in this life. Uh, we have exactly what we need to fight, uh, fight the battles uh, that we're facing in this nation, uh, but it's not going to come from you and I. It's got to come from the Word. Uh, only the Word digs in there deep. Uh, only the Word takes care of those situations. Uh, only the Word can reach down and fix the problems that we've got right now. The Bible says that he had made that sword, that dagger, 18 inches long. I believe him like this, Michael. One inch for every year of captivity. Yeah. The Bible says they were in captivity for 18 years. God is a God of details. Uh, I believe, amen, uh, that He made it an inch for every year that they were in captivity to prove to them uh, that there is not a place that you can get to that God can't reach. Uh, there's not a sin so deep that God can't touch. Uh, there's not a situation too great that God can't help. Uh, amen. The Bible says when He walked into that chamber, uh, amen, He thrust that dagger uh, into the belly of that man uh, and the half went in after it. Uh, meaning the handle uh, went in after it. Uh, that's exceedingly abundantly above. Uh, he made the dagger an inch for every year of captivity uh, but when the handle went in uh, that was God showing uh, he's able to do exceedingly uh, abundantly above all that we can think or ask but when the sword went in you know what came out the dirt came out you know what happens in this in, in this uh, uh, generation when the sword goes in bless God the dirt will come out the filth will come out 
There's some of you right now, I believe, uh, think there's some things in your life that are hidden. Uh, there's some things in your life, bless God, you think that nobody knows nothing about. Uh, but I'm telling you this, when the Word of God hits it, uh, He finds every crack, every inch, every little bit of dirt that there is. Uh, when Danny and I, uh, we just got a new vacuum cleaner a while back, and, and I was trying to do something nice. She was at work one day, and I happened to be off. Uh, and I was just going to sweep the foyer away. Just... Just one little room, uh, but I left the lights off. Uh, normally, I'd sweep with the lights on, uh, but I left the lights off because that vacuum's got a little light right on the front of it. Well, I realized something, Daniel. With the lights off and just that one light shining, you can see every speck of dirt in there. It didn't take me to sweep very long to realize I'm going to turn the light back on. <laughs> huh? I couldn't get it all and I thought well she sees it with the light on she'll never notice it either uh, and that's how many Christians live uh, they want to live with all the lights on uh, but nobody can dig in there and find a little bit of dirt uh, that little speck of dirt that's hidden in the corner uh, bless God God will make that known uh, God will bring that to light uh, God will show you exactly where you stand that's what the word of God does in our life but where did it say that he had that day. He hid it. And whenever I read that, dang, my mind just immediately went to Psalms 119, yep. verse 12. Amen. For his word have I hid in my heart yes. that I might not sin against God. See, there's, a, there's got to be a place that you get to in your life where you've got some things hidden away for when you need them. I think about this often, and I know I've said it before here, but what if the government had the ability to come in and take your Bibles, wipe the data off your phone. I mean, shut it all down. How much word would you have left? There was this missionary that was doing some work over in, in China, communist China. And he would go to these secret, they would have these secret meetings where these pastors and, 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 and church leaders would gather themselves together. And what he found out in that meeting, Daniel, was if in, in communist China, if they caught you uh, as a Christian, worshiping, practicing as a Christian, it's a minimum three years in a Chinese prison. Three years for them catching you. If your neighbors called in on you and said you were having service in your room next door, then they came in, they'd arrest everybody in the house, minimum three years in prison. He asked them, he said, how many of you, there were 42 of them in a room. He said, how many of you have spent time in prison? Every one of them raised their hand. Every one of them have been caught. He had brought a few Bibles with him, what he could get into a bag and, and, and bring in there. He didn't have enough for all of them. They were so thankful that when he handed them those Bibles, they began to cry. Because every one of them had, had their Bibles confiscated. Whenever they came in and they took, uh, took them to prison, they confiscated their Bibles and they burned them. So he brought them Bibles. He told them to turn to 1 Peter and he said, I don't have enough for everybody to just share with your neighbor. He said, turn to 1 Peter chapter number 3. So he began to read out of 1 Peter chapter number 3 and he looked, noticed the lady on the front row closed her Bible and handed it to her neighbor. And as he was reading, she was reciting every word of that chapter. He stopped. He said, ma'am, you don't need a Bible? She said, no, I know. I know this one. I memorized it. He said, where did you memorize it? She said, in prison. She said, you have much time to read in prison. He said, but they took your Bibles. How did you, how did you get it? He said, she said, well, my friends, when they would come to visit me, they would write verses down on a piece of paper and hand them to, to me. They, they, they'd sneak it to me. He said, what happens if they catch you with those, those pieces of paper with the Word of God on They would take them from us and add a year on our prison sentence. She said, so you learn to memorize very quickly. And I got to thinking about that, and I was looking around my study this morning. I've got five Bibles in my study. Five Bibles. I've got two apps on my phone, one app on my iPad. Danny's got a Bible, or two Bibles, and an app on her phone. I mean, we have access to the Word of God 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But how much do you have memorized? You say, Austin, I, I mean, I struggle... I struggle with memorizing stuff, yeah? But you can you can rattle off stats from a baseball game, uh, and you can rattle off stats from a football game, uh, and you can tell me everybody that played on the 1971 Bears team that went undefeated, uh, and you can tell me all 32 teams in the NBA, uh, and you can tell me all 32 teams in the NFL, uh, and you can tell me every player that played for the Mountaineers, uh, and then you can tell me all your multiplication tables that you learned uh, when you were in kindergarten and first grade. Uh, don't tell me you can't memorize the Bible. Uh, we memorize what we want to memorize. The truth is, we're 
or spoil it. And I don't need to memorize something that when I need to learn it or need to know it, I can Google it or I can pick it up and read it for myself. But what I'm telling you is this. We have got to get to a place uh, where the Word of God is so prominent in our life uh, that when I have a problem, I don't have to hear the Word of God open up. Uh, I can dig into my mind uh, and God can bring stuff back to my memory. Uh, I can put it in my heart uh, and God can bring it back to my memory. Uh, that when somebody asks me, uh, well, what is that hope and life within you? Uh, I'm able to give them an account. Uh, I'm able to give them a word. Uh, I'm able to give them something that they can grab a hold of. Because when you're in the store and somebody asks you about church or about salvation, you ain't got time to dig through your Bible and try to tell them something. You better know. We got to know what we know. And we got to dig in and realize, hey, we need to be putting as much in here huh, as the things of this world we're putting in here. I'm the world's worst at that, Josh. I was a big country music guy. And he'd tell you, going down the road, if, we, if, if there's a country, if there would be a country song come on the radio, I could probably sing every word, and the words I don't know, I just make up. <laughs> <laughs> I get the gist. Huh? Why is it, though, that when the man of God begins to open his Bible and read, that you're not able to get it pretty close from memory? You see, Austin, there's 66 books. Amen. I'm not asking you to memorize every one of them, but I'm saying you've got to put some stuff back in here that when you need it, you got it. That when the, when the problems begin in the middle of your day, you're able to dig from that. Because I, I don't know about you, but when I'm at work, I don't always have time to look it up. Yeah. When somebody at work spouts something off about the Lord or about the Bible, and they don't even realize what conversation they're fixing to get into, i got enough in memory that I can have that conversation at that moment. That's what we got to get to. If the Bible says he had that dagger hid, Somewhere that somebody couldn't take it away. Huh? Somebody, somewhere where somebody couldn't see it. Say, somewhere where it couldn't be, a, it, it couldn't be killed for having it. Somewhere, amen, that only he knew where it was at. We've got to be there. He was able to make it by those quarries. You know what those quarries were? They were soldiers. When he was going in to see the king, the Bible says that he went by all those quarries. Those were soldiers. So he was able to get that dagger, get that sword uh, by those soldiers because it was hidden somewhere where they couldn't see it. Uh, amen. Uh, hey, in this life, in this world that we live in right now, we got to put some things away uh, that this world, bless God, uh, they can't take it from you and they can't see it. Uh, amen. It's got to be somewhere uh, where it's hidden away for only you to be able to use. And he goes in there, and not only do I see that he has that dagger, that sword, but I see that he is deliberate in his actions. We as Christians, oftentimes, we need to be more deliberate in our actions. He went directly to the problem. See, this morning in your life, individually, you've got to figure out what dirt it is that the Holy Spirit of God is talking about this morning. And then when you come to the altar and pray, don't, don't dance around that sin. Be deliberate with it. He went right straight to the king. He said, I've got a secret for you. The king said, all right, let's go back into the secret chamber. Just him and the king. Just him and the prophet. Oftentimes I think about Elijah when he was standing there with Ahab. Huh? And he said, art thou he who troubled Israel? Yeah. He said, I'm not the problem. You're the problem. It's not me. It's you. And I think oftentimes in our life, the pastor gives a, a, an altar call. And, 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 and oftentimes it's kind of blanketed. But the Holy Spirit is dealing with you individually on what's going on in your life. And we want to tippy-toe and dance around it. Instead of going directly to the problem and taking care of it. Because that's what the sword of the Spirit does. That's what the Word of God does. It goes directly to where the issue is at. He's the one that takes care of those needs. I mean, if we were to do some, some self-checkup this morning, I believe that every one of us has some things in our life, but the Lord right now is saying, hey, you need to get rid of those things. You need to take care of those things. See, we oftentimes, we, talk, we think about drugs and, and the addiction that drugs are in someone's life, but we don't realize that hatred is just as addictive. Yeah, there you go. And jealousy and envy and strife. In the little things in our lives, because we classify sins, and if I'm not a drug addict or a drunkard, then I'm really not that bad. Uh, bless God, baby, you ain't that good either, amen? 
Oftentimes we want to we want to classify sin and we want to say, well, I'm not out cussing, I'm not out running around with my wife, I'm not doing all those things. So really things aren't that bad in my life, but you ain't serving God, so things ain't that good in your life either. And what the Lord is saying is, but you've got hatred in your heart. You've got malice in your heart. Yeah. You've got envy in your heart. And those things are addictive because they make the individual feel good for a moment. You say, I don't know about hatred make you feel good. Yeah, when you despise someone and you see them out and you have those feelings that come up on you, it feels good for a second to know I can't stand it. But you've got to realize something. It don't affect them at all. It don't affect that person at all. It only affects you. But it's addictive. It'll, it'll completely consume your mind. And then it'll begin to completely consume your life because you have such a bad feeling towards that individual that you can't go about life without wondering a word if you're going to see them and what they're doing. It's not just drugs and, and, and alcohol that are addictive. It's bad thoughts that are addictive. How many of you had a bad day before at work and you come home and your wife, she ain't had a bad day at work. In fact, she's had a good day. But nothing doing before you're done you both going to have a bad day. <laughs> See, when we get it down on the level where we can all really kind of understand it, because oftentimes we make these things unreachable. Right? Not me. That, he preaches everybody else this morning but me. Huh? But when I just sat down right there, you thought, ah, he got me. Why? Because he got me. We've all been there. Bad attitude like the flu, Amen. You take it over in the building. I'll use the building for just a minute. One of you kids have a bad day at school. Why don't you come in with a bad attitude? Nothing doing. Everybody at the table you're sitting at will have a bad attitude for it's done. Huh? It's like the flu, right? It just catches everybody. It's just going to get everybody. Spread fast. That's how it works. You say, well, what do we need to do? How do we need to fix that? you got to take the word to it. Huh? What's the Bible say about every day? Today is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. How many of you realize Monday is a hard day to rejoice and be glad in the Lord in <laughs> huh? Friday, think that ain't near as difficult. Huh? Some of you are tired this morning. You say, every day Saturday. I don't know what you're talking about. Bless your heart. Amen. <laughs> right? Every day is a day that the Lord hath made. Right? But well, we got to take the Word of God to it. Every issue in our life, you know what our job is? To take the Word of God to it. That's what, that's what we need to do. You say, Austin, I got marriage troubles. Take the word of God to it. I got problems with my kids. Take the word of God to it. I got financial troubles. Take the word of God to it. I, I got issues with my neighbor. Bless your heart. I do too. Take the word of God to it. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. You know how many times I've wanted to say things and the Lord has said, no. Yeah. I said, what? No. That's your witness. That's your ability to tell them about the Lord. And you know what Austin's got to do? Bite my lip. You know what it'll do? It's awesome good to do. Bite her till she bleeds sometimes. Amen? <laughs> yeah. Take the word of God to it. The Bible says he was delivered in his action. He went right directly to the problem. He went right straight in there and stuck that sword, stuck the word of God right where it needed to be. Not only do we see delivered action, but we see a declaration of victory. Now I really skipped through all of that that the Lord had given this morning because that's what the Lord wanted. Me. I see a, a declaration of victory. So he goes in and he takes care of the problem and when he goes out, what's he do? Hang on, shut the door behind him. Yeah. What's that a signification of? Huh? Leaving it. Yeah. Walking away from it. Being done. When you got saved, you did this very same thing. You came to this altar, you got rid of the situations in your life, you got rid of the problems in your life, you got rid of the hatred, the envy, the strife, whatever it was that was bothering you in your life, and you turned around and you shut the door on that chapter of your life. It was over. It was done. But how many times as Christians in our life do we have to go back and there's something else going on in our life and we've got to take care of that but we don't shut the door on it? Yeah. We don't put it to rest. It continues to nag at us. It continues to bother us. It continues to, we just continue to deal with that over and over and over again. What the Lord wants us to do this morning is be delivered in our action. Bring it to Him. The same place you got saved is the same place you come back and fix things in your life. 
The same place that you came to an altar of prayer and asked God to save you is the same place you've come back often times and say, Lord, I need your help in keeping me. Now, Lord, I've got this situation going on. I've got that situation going on. Lord, I didn't handle this quite the right way. I, I didn't handle that quite the right way. And so you come back and you put the Word of God on it and then you close the door behind you. You leave it there. But you can only do that when you take the Word of God to it. Yeah. And the Bible says he went out on the Mount of Ephraim and he sounded the trumpet. You say, what was that? He shouted the victory. When you get victory in your life, you need to tell somebody about it. When God helps you in your life, uh, whenever He takes care of a situation, you say, Austin, I'm embarrassed that I was ever there. But you don't know who beside you may be going through the same thing uh, and they're struggling the same way that you were on it. Uh, and once they hear God delivered you from it, they know God can deliver them from it. Because oftentimes in our life, the secretness of our sin not only hurts us, but it hurts those that are around us. Because they, they're dealing with the similar things that we're dealing with. And they're just not sure if God can help them or not until you tell them that they can. He made that declaration of victory. He went out and he, he sounded the trumpet and he told them, he said, I want you to come. And the Bible says they begin to ford the Jordan. And they went over and they, they took out the Moabites and then he went after the Ammonites, and they went, then they went after Amalek. Everybody that put them in bondage, they turned around and went right back, and God began to give them the victory. But the victory didn't come until the dirt was gone. The victory didn't come until the dirt was taken care of. Now I realize this morning, we have jumped this morning from the individual and dirt in your life to the church and dirt in the church's life to society and dirt in, the, in, in society and in the government that we're dealing with right now. I realize all of that. But what I want you to realize is this. The Holy Spirit of God knows what you need individually. But you hear me and hear me well. We have to take a stand on these needs, on these situations that I, I, I preached on this morning. We have to take a stand. If we don't stand up right now, if this bill passes, any Sunday that we gather in here, that we begin to preach the Word of God, every one of us could be held liable. Every single one of us could be held. You say, well, what about religious freedom? That's the exact thing that they're trying to take down. That's the exact thing that they're trying to write uh, the bill against. That very thing. You look at the outside of that bill. Danny and I discussed it at first. You look at the outside of the bill. It sounds so, so nice. Everybody created equal. Everybody's equal. Everybody should be equal. But when you start digging in depth to what's going on in it, it ain't about being equal. And that's not what it's about. You say, Austin, I just don't see how that affects me. I don't really have kids in school. Shame on you. Austin, I, I don't see how, how it affects me. My kids are grown. They've already made their decision. Shame on you. You say, Austin, I, I, just don't, I don't really see how it affects me. I'm not a pastor. Shame on you. It takes all of us standing together. Yeah. Every one of us. I won't back down from this. Clarence Blackwell looked at me over in his house. I don't even remember. It, uh, eight years ago. And we, we were praying. He, I took him over some hot dogs. I don't, and, and I know now why the Lord had me take him over the hot dogs. And he said, son, I want to pray with you before you, before you leave. I just announced my call to preach, so it's been seven and a half years ago. He said, I want to pray with you before you leave. I said, okay. I knew Clarence. I didn't know him, know him. I knew him. Josh and I were friends. But I didn't know him. In Reamer, know him. I went to Falling Rock. I'd been in church with him some, but I didn't, I didn't know him. Either. He was in that. Carol, he was in his, in his walker. He came through the house. I could hear him. I knocked on the door, and I could hear him just trying to get through the house. He had that chair on his walker, and I thought he was just going to turn around, and anybody, you guys already know, he wasn't, but I thought he was just going to turn around and sit on the walker because he couldn't hardly move, much less get down. And he said, if you'll give me just a minute, he said, I want to get down on the floor. Now that, that alone spoke volumes to me. That, that in itself, Daniel. 
that a man that was that, that, that was that old and that feeble thought that much of the Lord to humble it. Physically, he said, if I get down, you got to get me up, but I want to get down and pray. And he thought that much of the Lord to humble himself. Shame on us! He said, son, I, you're going to face some things in your ministry that I've never seen. And I thought about him this morning, Jake, whenever Doug and I'm in, a, I'm in a pastor text with Doug and Tim and Robbie Legg and Tim Parsons and Tom Price and Clarence and, uh, I mean, there's Kevin Jennings. There's a bunch of us in a, in a text this morning. And they had sent this text out about the vote being this week and that we needed to, to be discussing with our churches that there was a phone number that we needed to be calling to voice our opinion on this bill and the vote that was going to take place. So all these pastors this morning are preaching similar messages that I'm preaching right now. Because we all agree that this ain't good. But it brought back to my mind as I was sitting in my study studying this morning that prayer that we had over there. When he said, son, you're going to face some things in your ministry I've never seen. My mind honestly can't, can't even comprehend it, but I just know that it's coming. You're talking about a man that spent time as a prisoner of war and fought for this country, came back and, and devoted his whole life to serving God, had seen some things, and looked at a young preacher and said, you're going to face some things that I can't even imagine. He said, I'm going to pray right now that God will protect you and help you for when that time comes. So I'm studying this morning, and the Lord brought that back. And we knelt down in the floor right there. And if the walls and the windows and the doors wasn't shaking in that house, I'd be standing here this morning. I mean, the power of God failed. I knew that he had touched heaven with that prayer. But Carol, I didn't know how much that prayer was going to help me seven and a half years later as I'm standing here this morning preaching a message to you. I don't take the things lightly of knowing of the men of God that stood here before me and fought a different battle than I'm fighting right now, but they prayed for me even before they knew me. You say, what were they praying for? They were praying for this pulpit. Yeah. They were praying for this Amen. church, that it would stand the, the test of time, that no matter what happened in this world, and in the last year we've seen some stuff happen, but I don't believe 2021 is going to be better than 2020. I, I believe it's going to be worse. Amen. You say, well, I voted for, I don't care who you voted for. I'm talking about the filth that's getting voted on right now. They had no idea what we were going to be facing this year, but they've already prayed for it. See, prayer absolutely changes things. It matters. It makes a difference. The only thing that separates us from the world is a Savior. That's the only difference. Each one of us gets up every single day the same way they get up. Go through the same things every single day that they go through. The difference is we have a Savior and the world does not. Now I'm asking you this morning like I've never asked you before. It's important that we do our part. Dana, if you'll come and just get ready to play. It's important that we do our part. Yes. What does it start with? It starts with prayer, yes. and it ends with picking up the phone and calling the numbers and letting your voice be heard that you're not for the equality bill. And you're not for anybody that votes for it. I'm not for the filth that's going on in this world. I'm not for the senators and the governors and all that that stand for the field that's going on in this world. I'm not for a president that this was the one thing that he said he was going to push and people voted for him anyway. You can't pick one thing and say, well, he stands for this, so I'm going to vote for him. And 15 things over here are nonsense. And you say, well, that's the right candidate. Hogwash. If it goes against the very beliefs that you stand on, he ain't the guy. You say, well, what can we do? We got to pray. 
You say, well, he's in there now. What's the point? Because only God knows what God's doing. That's right. We're still one nation under God. It doesn't matter how dark it seems out there. It doesn't matter how difficult it is out there. We got to stand up for what's right. We got to stand up for what we believe in. We got to make the right call and the right stand. We have to do that. So I'm going to ask you this morning as Dina plays that you come and pray for those very things. That you'll come and pray for those very things. As we stand to our feet, as Dina plays, would you come this morning?